Hello. Namaskaram. Hola. Annyeonghaseyo. Nao. Salo. Namaskar. Jasas. Hi there. I'm Celine. And I'm Maida. And we're the hosts of ESRs On Air, a podcast by researchers for science enthusiasts. This is the first podcast of the BQ Minded European Training Network. Welcome to the second episode of ESRs On Air. Today we will talk about an amazing technique that allows us to look inside the human body, magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI. And to properly explain to you how it all works, Mayra and I invited three of our Beaky Mind colleagues. Hello everyone, our guests and friends joining us today are Michele, or Mick, and Banafshe, who are both PhD candidates from the University of Antwerp in Belgium, and Vincenzo, also a PhD candidate from the University of Antwerp, who is hosted by Icometrics in Belgium. Thanks so much for joining us today. Before we start our conversation about MRI, I would like to invite you to introduce yourself to our listeners. Yes. Hi, everyone. And uh, thanks, Mayra and Salin, for inviting me to this episode. Uh, I'm Ben Afse. I'm originally from Iran, but now I'm doing my PhD in the University of Antwerp in Belgium. Uh, I'm mainly working with accelerating the MRI scans, accelerating the acquisition of MRI scans. Great. Uh, Michele? Hi, Mayra. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm very happy to about participating to this episode. So I'm Michele, I'm uh, from Italy. As you already anticipated, I'm doing my PhD at University of Antwerp and my topic is uh, super loss solution. There is a post-processing technique used to enhance uh, the resolution in images. So that's it for me. Great, uh, Vincenzo? Hello everyone, I'm Vincenzo and thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to join this episode and talk about one of my favorite topics, MRI. I'm originally from Italy and I studied biomedical engineering in Rome and now I live in Leuven in Belgium where I'm um, working on a PhD project about the robust quantification of diffusion parameters from brain images. Great, we have a group working on different topics and all from the same project that is BQ Minded. So it'll be very nice to have you all discussing about MRI today with us. Thank you. So many people our age have been inside an MRI scanner, or at least seen it on TV, maybe in Grey's Anatomy, without really knowing how it works or how it interacts with the body. So Banafshe, could you maybe introduce the concept of MRI to our listeners? Yes, sure. MRI, as we most of us know, is a medical imaging technique that non-invasively examines the body organs and produces high-resolution images with an excellent contrast from what's inside the body. An MRI scanner is mainly a large tube that you lie on it uh, to have a part of your body scanned. Actually, before I started my studies in biomedical engineering, I had only seen this uh, large white tube in movies, where unfortunately, normally an actor that soon in that movie is going to be diagnosed with a brain tumor or something is lying on the bed, which moves into this tube. The big tube is actually the main essential part of the MRI scanner that contains a very powerful, like three Tesla magnet, which is actually 60,000 times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. MRI uses magnetic fields and radio frequency waves to generate a detailed image of an organ in the body. One can say that MRI somehow scans the water molecules in our body. It measures the amount of the water and somehow maps the location of the water molecules to generate an image. And luckily enough, our bodies are made up approximately 65% to 70% water, so MRI has a lot of signals to measure. Since different tissues in the body may contain different amounts of water molecules, that these molecules uh, show different behavior during an MRI exam, MRI is able to generate a contrast between different soft tissues in the body. For example, it nicely demonstrates the differences between gray matter, white matter, and CSF in the brain and shows exact structure of these different tissues inside the brain. Oh, very interesting. Uh, MRI seems very powerful indeed. So maybe Mick, you can explain more about how the MRI scanner interacts with our body? Sure, it's my pleasure. So let's start where Banafshe left. So Banafshe mentioned that our body is made of around 65% of water. That is a lot. Uh, by the way, there is a recent study that apparently in Belgium, this percentage is a bit higher due to the consumption of beer. Uh, no, that's not true. Um, <laughs> however, coming back to the water, 
uh, if we look at the hydrogen in more detail, we see um, that it is composed by a central nucleus containing a single positive charge uh, that is called a proton. And this proton is constantly spinning on its axis. So uh, let's forget about the quantum mechanics here. Let's just think of it as a spinning top. At this moment, while I'm talking, we all have billions of hydrogen protons in our bodies spinning, all oriented in random positions. Think of all those hydrogen protons as they were you and your classmates during high school. <laughs> I can imagine you were so happy to meet your friend that often the situation in the class got quite chaotic, maybe. Now, imagine your grumpiest teacher arriving in the class. So the situation then will definitely change. All of you, a bit less happy than before, would have to take place at your desk and give her the attention she demands. Now, we need a grumpy teacher for our hydrogen protons as well. And that's the exact role of the huge magnet that is embodied in the MAR scanner. So as soon as you enter the scanner or your hydrogen protons uh, interact with the main magnetic field, they will keep spinning, but this time they will be no more randomly oriented, but they will all be aligned uh, in the direction of the magnetic field. So this example concludes the first interaction that we can refer to as the call of duty of the protons. So I hope so far is clear. I hope you like the example because I want to keep it on for a bit. So since we can all relate with this example, uh, now the teacher wants to examine some of her students with an oral test. So this is, was really scary actually on my time. So it calls them by name and asks them to answer her questions. This happens during the Morai session as well in some form. So after you get into the scanner and all the protons are paying attention to the main magnetic field, some of them belonging maybe to a specific area of interest will be called by name and interrogated, but not by a teacher, but from a radio frequency pulse. To call a proton by name, the transmitted radio frequency pulse will have to be at the same frequency of the proton. This phenomenon is called resonance. So if this condition is met, the radio frequency pulse will be able to interact with the protons. The radio frequency pulse will deposit a certain amount of energy that will make the protons flip away from the main orientation. Then, as soon as the radio frequency pulses are turned off, the protons will recover the original position, releasing the stored energy. This released signal by the protons is the signal that the magnetic resonance acquires and finally will be converted in the image that the radiologist will analyze. Okay, so we know that we need a magnetic field, some RF pulses, but is that really all? Is that how it all works? Vincenzo, can you maybe elaborate a bit? Absolutely. The first time I entered an MR scanner, it was more than 10 years ago, uh, because of a dislocation of my left kneecap. My knee needed to be scanned because uh, the doctors wanted to check whether I needed surgery or not. Luckily, surgery was not necessary. At that time, I had no clue of how an MR scanner worked. I only remember that it took approximately 15 minutes and I was hearing weird noising throughout the examination. Normally, a clinical MRI session can take even longer, up to one hour in certain cases. So that's why within the Video Mind project, one of our common goals is to achieve shorter acquisition times. I started to realize what happened that day of my first scan a few years later during my university studies as biomedical engineer. Imagine that you need to undergo an MR examination because of a brain injury, for example. You will normally go to the radiology department of a hospital. And there you will notice that there are two separate rooms. A first room, which is the MRI room, where the scanner takes place and where you will lie down throughout the examination. And the second room, the operator room, from where the radiologist uh, guides the session and makes sure that everything goes smooth. Now, the main ingredients of an MR acquisition session are the magnet, the gradient coils, the radio frequency coils, and a computer, a very powerful one. The strong magnet generates this homogeneous magnetic field, which is static, and it's on for all the time of the examination. Then we have the gradient coils. When electric current passes through them, they produce a secondary magnetic field. This gradient field adjusts the main magnetic field according to a certain pattern, so that we have smaller sections of different magnetic strengths. 
In this way, we can isolate specific body parts, for example, the knee in my case, or if we want, the brain, based on their spatial position. The rapid switching of currents inside the gradient coils results in a loud acoustic noise. To have an idea, we can think at a um, jackhammer used in a construction site. So it's not that pleasant. And that's why you will wear earplugs or headphones during your scanning session. Then we have the radio frequency coils. They may work as transmitters, receivers, or both. So we can consider them a bit as the antenna of the MRI system. When working as transmitters, these coils produce the radio frequency pulses that excite the protons, as Michele explained in his examples. While the static field is always on, these radio frequency pulses are turned on for shorter periods of time, a few milliseconds. And when they work as receivers, then their function is to collect the signal. The detected signal is finally sent to the powerful computer and all the information is translated into an image of your body using advanced medical imaging software. This is very fascinating in my opinion. And so now as a PhD researcher and working in MRI every day, I can finally explain where those weird noises that I heard come from. That's super interesting, Vincenzo. That's indeed very noisy equipment that we have to be around when acquiring data, being a patient or being a researcher as we are ourselves. So thank you very much for this explanation. But now I have another question. With all these loud noises, what we can see with those images? Maybe you guys can talk a little bit further on that? I guess I'll start also because to answer this question, we should first speak a little bit about the concept of contrast. And for this, uh, there is still our example of our class that can be of much help. So in the former part, uh, the teacher came in and decided to conduct an oral test for some lucky students. Now the teacher must collect their answers and convert them into grades. So I don't know how it was for you when you were at high school, but in my class, we were used to meet in small groups and study together. The main consequence of this approach was that some groups were very diligent and get very good grades, while others ended up not studying at all. Please don't ask me what group I was part of. <laughs> so the grades were similar within groups and quite different among groups, apart from some outliers. So therefore, looking at the final grades, it was possible to distinguish in which group the student belonged. Now, you will probably be surprised, but also the hydrogen protons splitting groups, and these groups are nothing more than the different kind of tissues of which our body is composed of. When excited by radio frequency pulse, the protons belonging to different tissues will release energy, generating different types of signal. So, because of this concept of an MRI image, we can see and distinguish in an excellent way the different kind of tissues. This procedure can be actually easily generalized for any anatomical department, a brain, knee, heart, that we're interested in. But I think that I can ask Banafshi to add something more. Yes, that's true. Considering these different contrasts between different tissues, MRI can show the structure of different organs in the body. And then an expert later can look at these MRI images and tell you if something is wrong with that organ or the structure is pretty normal. But that's not all. More interestingly, MRI scans can be designed to be sensitive to capture some specific pathologies and be used in early diagnosis of those diseases. As some types of tumors, for example, can change a tissue property that MRI is sensitive to. For example, they can hinder the random movement of the water molecules inside the tissue. In this way, those tumors can be seen in their early stages in the specific types of MRI images, which are sensitive to the water molecule diffusivity or the random motion. This way, the tumors can be detected before they have any other indications. I personally work on the diffusion-rated imaging during my PhD, which is used in clinics vastly for this purpose. Moreover, MRI is not only about the structure. It can also be used to acquire several images during a time frame from a certain slice of the tissue and reveal the dynamic changes of that tissue. Something like a movie. 
in this way, it can capture the function of that organ and imagine uh, your brain is being scanned while you are thinking about something and a functional MRI shows which regions of your brain are activated during the flow of your thoughts. But there are even more type of contrasts that maybe Vincenzo can talk about them. Yes, as the Nafshe said, MRI is a great diagnostic tool able to show pathological processes going on in a certain tissue or organ. To make this possible, there must be a contrast in the images. For example, there must be a difference in signal intensity between healthy and pathological tissue. Luckily, in MRI, this is not an issue because we have not only one, but multiple sources of contrast arising from tissue-specific physical parameters, namely the proton density and the relaxation times. The term relaxation is probably not so easy to understand, but it refers to the processes by which an excited magnetic state goes back to its equilibrium. We distinguish the longitudinal relaxation time, or T1, and the transverse relaxation time, or T2. To recap, the three main sources of contrast in MRI are proton density, T1 relaxation time, and T2 relaxation time. In most MR images, we actually observe a mixture of all these effects. And by using specific imaging sequences, we can emphasize one contrast mechanism over the others. Basically, an MR sequence is a combination of radio frequency pulses and pulsed field gradients that determine the appearance of the images. In short, by choosing the MR sequence, we can acquire images that are mainly proton density weighted T1 weighted or T2 weighted. The possibility to highlight a specific contrast mechanism by choosing the appropriate sequence makes MRI an incredibly flexible, powerful, and I would say unique diagnostic tool. Proton density T1 and T2 are the most popular sources of contrast in MRI, and probably they are also the well-known sources of contrast. But that's not all, there is much more. Similarly to Banafshe, I'm specifically working with diffusion-weighted images. In this case, the image contrast is dependent on the diffusion, or let's say the random movement of water molecules inside the tissues. Oh, so that's how you generate all these different images with different types of contrast. Very interesting. Thank you. Maybe a question about safety now. You talked about three Tesla magnets, 60,000 times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. It's pretty strong. Is it actually really safe? I guess this is the most asked question in the MRI world. There is nothing to be scared. MRI is considered one of the safest imaging modalities. It doesn't use at all ionizing radiation, of which people are usually scared of. The radio frequencies used in MRI are like the radiation emitted by your cell phones. However, also when using radio frequency in both cell phones and MRI, Tissue absorption of the radio frequency can cause the tissue to heat up. Uh, you might have experienced after a long call with your partner using your phone close to your ear, a sensation of warmth left by your phone on your ear. It was not your partner's fault, but it was caused by such radiation. The metric used to quantify this phenomenon is called specific absorption rate, SAR. It measures the amount of radio frequency power absorbed per amount of tissue. Thus, it depends on the amount of tissue exposed. MRI scanners have built-in methods to calculate and measure the SAR dose for individual patients and to ensure that SAR is always within the safe limits carefully defined by regulatory bodies. I agree with you that MRI is safe, Mick, but if you allow me, I want to just add this quick point that it might be a little bit uncomfortable sometimes, especially if you have the fear of the confined and closed spaces uh, or claustrophobia, and then you need to be inside the MRI scanner for quite a long time. This is unfortunately the case with me and makes me uncomfortable with being inside the MRI scanner. Since I've started my master's studies related to MRI imaging, I have asked many of my friends and relatives to be inside the MRI scanner for my research purpose. But honestly, I can never imagine being there myself. Even now, the thought uh, is making me claustrophobic. Oh, really? I love taking a little nap in a scanner. <laughs> <laughs> 
And there's also another important aspect to consider. Before undergoing an MR scanning session, you will always be asked to take off any metal accessory you're wearing. Metal and electronic items such as jewelry may in fact interfere with the magnetic field. Thus, they are not allowed into the MRI room. If ferromagnetic objects are accidentally introduced in the MR scanner room, then they are attracted by the static magnetic field and propelled into the scanner with enormous force. This is known as projectile or missile effect. Fortunately, these events are pretty rare, but accidents have been reported, typically involving large objects like oxygen cylinders, walkers, or wheelchairs. The take home message here is that MRI is definitely a safe technique, but both patients and operators always need to remain vigilant. In particular, each one of us as a potential patient need to inform the MR operator if you have an implant in your body or a pacemaker, heart stents or heart valves. Because in some circumstances, such devices may even prevent the exam from taking place. That's very interesting, you guys. Thank you very much for all this insight on MRI, how it works. It's very interesting. And I hope that our audience enjoys the explanation as much as we did. So with this extensive discussion today, I think we are reaching the end of our second episode. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, if you have anything else that you would like to say. Yes, thank you very much. And I hope that we were able to transfer a little bit of our passion for MRI to the listeners. Thanks to you for hosting us and thanks to the audiences for listening to this episode. I hope that our explanations were clarifying enough about the MRI. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak a little today about the big world of MRI that is the passion that unites us. Keep up the good job and looking forward to the next episode. We hope you enjoyed our second episode about the how and the why of MRI. If you're thinking about embarking on an MRI research journey yourself, or if you have any questions about European-funded research opportunities in general, feel free to send us a message through any of our social media channels. Just look for Beaky Minded on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Hit the subscribe button and follow us on the podcast platform of your choice. Stay tuned for new episodes of ESRs on Air. Bye for now. This project has received funding from the European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Program under the Maris Clouteau's Calcurie Grant Agreement No. 764513. The institutes that make part of BQ Minded are University of Antwerp, University of Leeds, Erasmus Medical Center, Jullich Research Center, Zimmers Healthineers, Antwerp University Hospital, MR Solutions, Icometrics, and Quantip.